Good evening, everyone, and welcome to our events this evening. I'm delighted that so many people have joined us for the launch of this important uh, community heritage project at Greyfriars Kirkyard, led by our graveyard projects manager, Dr. Susan Buckham. Susan is a leading expert on Scottish historic burial sites, drawing on 20 years of experience in graveyard recording, conservation, research and interpretation. Susan's knowledge and skills spans graveyard history and development, conservation good practice, and the policy and legislation relevant to burial ground management and protection. Several years ago, when I was very much green behind the ears in the whole world of graveyards, Susan also explained what a lair was to me, which is a fantastic Scottish word, which I've remembered ever since. So I'll hand over to Susan, who will take us through the evening, and over to you, Susan. Thank you very much, Nick. Well, what makes Greyfriars Kirkyard special and worth preserving? This is what Edinburgh World Heritage is going to be asking over the next two years with our Making Lasting Impressions project. And we aim to answer this question by involving a wider range of people with the Kirkyard so that they decide what is important about it. Using their own words, they will describe its value to them and then share their ideas with others using interpretation. Our goal is to connect people from different backgrounds and to bring different interests together through a common focus on Greyfriars Kirkyard as a shared community place. Tonight, I'll outline how you can get involved in the new project. I want to spark your interest in using our new interpretation once it is created. But my real goal, however, is to prompt your curiosity into what others see of interest in the Kirkyard and how this may in turn affect the value you place on Greyfriars. Well, curiosity is most definitely where Edinburgh World Heritage is starting from. We don't feel that there's a single way to look at Greyfriars Kirkyard. Rather, this site can be interpreted in multiple ways. Each impression is valid because it helps us to build up a better understanding of the graveyard and to understand its value to people today. We believe that this approach can help readdress the current imbalance where on the one hand, Greyfriars Kirkyard, Scotland's most famous graveyard, iconic, is recognised as being highly significant, not least by its World Heritage Site and Category A listed building designations. But on the other hand, its landscape and history is not fully recorded, studied or explained, which limits how well people can understand it. Now, you may be surprised by this characterisation, so let's explore this point in a little bit more detail, looking at some of the things we do know about Greyfriars Kirkyard and then some of the things that we don't know. Before inviting our special guests to tell us more about the impression that Greyfriars has made on them. Afterwards, I will describe what the project will do and how you can join in. So the Greyfriars Kirkyard was founded in 1562 on the site of a former Franciscan friary with land gifted by Mary Queen of Scots. Its landscape closely links to the development of the city of Edinburgh itself, with the Kirkyard's extensions partially following the city's boundaries marked by the Flodden and Telfer walls. Today, the Kirkyard makes a significant contribution to the greening of distant views in the old town and to the setting of its surrounding buildings. The Kirkyard's character is uniquely defined by the materials used, the variety of architectural styles and monument types, and the craft and design skills these embody. Sir Walter Scott reputedly described Greyfriars Kirkyard as the Westminster Abbey of Scotland, recognising both the significance of the people buried there, who include leading statesmen and Scottish Enlightenment figures, but also its role in nationally important events, such as the signing of the National Covenant in 1638, and the holding of 1,200 prisoners after the Battle of Bothwell Bridge decades later in an area of ground still known today as the Covenanters' Prison. The monuments are exceptionally significant, many by the foremost masons and architects of the day. Critically, with so little 17th century sculpture surviving in Scotland, Greyfriars is Scotland's leading resource for the period. It is quite literally an outdoor museum collection. 
but many of the earliest and most important gravestones suffer from serious stone decay. All face the significant ongoing threat from weathering and erosion. There are over 760 gravestones in Greyfriars Kirkyard, and we have barely scratched the surface in understanding the ideas that sparked their creation, their purpose, and the impressions they made on people's minds over time to result in them either being cherished or neglected. Now here we can see the mural monument to six generations of the Milne family, master carvers to several kings. Now this is a rare example where we can trace the design inspiration to a printed pattern book, in this case one from Italy. What's significant here is the use of carved grotesque faces known as green men. The late Betty Wilshire, the leading expert on Scottish gravestones, discovered that it is only in Scotland where we find green men used on gravestones. Now the first recorded green men on gravestones was found here in Greyfriars Kirkyard and the four prominent examples on the Milne Monument sparked a fashion for this symbol that spread across the whole of southern Scotland. Another area where we have brief but intriguing snippets of the graveyard's history is in terms of how people used it. Its main purpose was for burial, however as an open common area other uses throughout the 16th and 17th centuries resulted in Greyfriars becoming central to borough life. It was used as a gathering and socialising space, a drill ground and a place for Wappenshaw to show the arms and that the city could be defended if attacked. A thorn tree located near the centre of the kirkyard was used as both a reference point to measure lengths and distances and as a point, a meeting point for the local townspeople. One local historian tells us that in 1662, part of the ground was used as a racing track for noblemen. Who can forget Robbie Louis Stevenson's vivid portrayal of the graveyard in the early 19th century, with the living and the dead residing cheek by jowl, laundry flapping against gravestones, the site overrun by cats who congregated on the Milne family monument children feeding sparrows or challenging the ghost of bloody Mackenzie to come out of the mausoleum and chase them. Now this picture stands in stark contrast to early 19th century newspaper articles with the dramatic headlines of graveyard police describing the efforts by the town council as the graveyard's owners to chase people away from visiting the gravestones. Now Edinburgh Council remained the graveyard's owners today and is a key project partner for Edinburgh World Heritage. So I'd like to reassure you that the city very much supports community visitors today. Now, surprisingly, we don't know too much about the nature of current community use of Greyfriars Kirkyard. But a visitor survey carried out by Edinburgh World Heritage in 2011, which is the only visitor survey that I know that has been carried out for the site, found that 87% of the people who were questioned believed that Greyfriars was an asset to the local community. But the same survey pointed out that in order to encourage better community use, there was a real need for more accessible information to be made available to help people better understand the graveyard. From the hundreds of gravestones in Greyfriars, only a few are familiar largely due to their links with Harry Potter and Greyfriars Bobby, or with ghost stories such as Mackenzie's Mausoleum. There has been virtually no new storytelling for Greyfriars since Victorian times, with the notable exception of Harry Potter, which is, and Harry Potter is, is somewhat of a double-edged sword really, given its contribution to the over-tourism in the graveyard, which has resulted in damage to the landscape's condition, but also to its character. It has really constrained public enjoyment of the Kirkyard as a relaxing green space. And Greyfriars is a green lung within the city, a place to escape from the hustle and bustle of everyday life and to connect to local history, but also to the natural environment. Now let's hear more on this point just now from Sonny, a guide with the Invisible Cities and a member of the Grassmarket Community Project, two organisations 
um, that work with people affected by homelessness, who are both of which are our project partners. Uh, I just want to tell you a wee bit about the cemetery. Obviously, most people think it's just places where people are buried and they're quite old and stuff, which I totally agree. Uh, Greyfriars Cemetery is a really historic place, but it's actually, believe it or not, quite a safe place for uh, homeless people. A lot of homeless people come to these places because they feel safe, there's police that don't come here, there's no the drunks to annoy them and stuff when they're sleeping in alleyways and stuff. So they come here and there's a lot of shelter and stuff, as you can see, under the rain and the snow. Uh, so a lot of people do feel safe in cemeteries, believe it or not. Uh, and I've actually slept in cemeteries myself when I was homeless and I did feel safer than in here than I did in the streets. Another social enterprise where we are in Visible Edinburgh, the Grass Market Community Project. Uh, they have a garden project and they send all the volunteers up here and they do all the gardening work uh, just to try and cheer the place up a bit. And to be honest, they do a great job and it's very beneficial for the volunteers. Uh, it's a lot of people with mental health, mental health problems. As they say, like, a lot of gardening work uh, helps with mental health problems and I totally agree, I think it's a great thing. So understanding how the kirkyard is on, on the site of a former friary gives an added dimension to the association's Greyfriars home holds as a place of safety, sanctuary if you like. Providing sanctuary to those in need was a function of pre-Reformation churchyards and indeed the friary gave protection to King Henry VI and Queen Margaret for three years during the mid 15th century. The friary's garden grew medicinal herbs to help tend the sick and to the poor, which directly influenced the plants chosen by the volunteers for their own gardening project. Now, storytelling is central to the Lasting Remains project because it can inspire new thinking about what heritage is and who it is for. I like to use the phrase storytelling because it's accessible but I am describing how factual information is recast into narrative form. Stories bring people, places, objects, and ideas to life and help audiences better understand their meaning and the historical cultural context which they existed in, in an enjoyable way. To this end, how fantastic would it be if Greyfriars visitors found out about the real life Tom Riddell? who inspired J.K. Rowling's Tom Riddle and his connections to the transatlantic slave trade, meeting with Captain Cook and links with Lord Kames, the Scottish Enlightenment figure. Well, sadly, there isn't time really um, to go into any more detail about this tonight, but it will form um, one of the first stories that we deal with in our first project newsletter. So please do subscribe to the project's newsletter. But let's hear now from our three guest speakers who will tell us a Greyfriars story. So first of all, I would like to welcome Fraser Patterson, a local historian who runs his own walking tour company, edinburghtoursandhistory.com. And he's gonna tell us about the Cheesley Monument. Over to you, Fraser. Greyfriars Kirkyard interests me because of the family histories linked to its gravestones. For me, the excitement lies in never quite knowing where these stories will take you. Here is an impressive monument that speaks strongly through its symbols and size. The brief inscription tells only that Walter Cheesley, an Edinburgh merchant, built it for his dear wife, Catherine Todd after her death in 1679. To modernise, the skeleton and skulls foretell the dreadful, scandalous story of their son, John Cheesley of Dalry. But in the 17th century, carvings of skulls reminded people that how one behaved on earth during their mortal life would be used to judge the fate of their eternal life, bringing either damnation or a heavenly afterlife. In the central panel, there's a pair of angels placing a crown of righteousness on a skeleton. Both the angels and the crown celebrate the resurrection, 
and Walter's belief that his good wife would go to heaven. Large monuments like this show a family's status and success. Looking into a family's history can reveal where this may skip a generation. Their son, John Cheesley, did not emulate his parents' successful marriage and didn't uphold the family's good, mind, good name through living a virtuous life on earth. In 1688, John and his wife began divorce proceedings. John was a wealthy, owning the family's estate of Dalry, now one of Edinburgh's most populated areas. At this time, if a husband separated from his wife, he could expect to leave scot-free, paying nothing in settlement. Imagine then his fury when the judge, Lord Lockhart, awarded John's ex-wife an annual allowance. Seething, John plotted his revenge. He knew where Lockhart lived and that he worshipped in St Giles every Sunday. So on Easter Sunday, 1689, with his pistol loaded, John followed the judge into church, sat behind him, and once the service was finished, he followed Lockhart home. There, Cheesley took aim and fired. Lockhart fell dead upon the cobbles. Witnesses seized John, who made no attempt to run or protest his innocence. Cheesley was sentenced to death by hanging. Before execution, the right hand that fired the fatal shot was cut off and tied with the gun around his chest. Later, his body was taken in secret to Dalry for burial on the family estate. In contrast, Lord Lockhart was granted the rare honour of burial inside Greyfriars Kirk, a token of the city's respect. Years later, when the Dalry estate was sold for housing, many early residents reported seeing a screeching figure, missing a right hand and a pistol strapped around its skeletal chest. That ghost is known as One-Armed Johnny. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Fraser. Genealogy is such a popular interest area for graveyards. So I really do thank you for showing us how family history can also be used to research place. And I have to say, I'm never going to think about Dal Rye in exactly the same way again. And I think your focus was particularly apt, given that the first published book of Scottish gravestone inscriptions was of Greyfriars Kirkyard. And it appeared in 1704 with the short title of A Theatre of Mortality. Well, the next act in our very own Theatre of Mortality this evening is Charlotte Gulledge, a local historian and author who has carried out lots of research on Greyfriars Kirkyard, not least for her MA dissertation, which provides the topic for her talk tonight on Thomas Smith. Over to you, Charlotte. Now, Greyfriars, without doubt, is home to some of Scotland's most magnificent 17th century monuments, which are drenched in the symbolism that depicts the values of the day. Just a stroll up the west wall and a quick glance can easily show what each is, which each is saying with the grinning skulls, the trumpeting angels and the plump cherubs. However, the specific messages are a little lost in modern day life. However, if we take a step through the Flodden Wall and into the West Yard, the monuments are a stark contrast. Save the odd example of a couple of tasteful, discreet angels, there is none of the symbolism. In fact, although large in size, they appear rather plain, their script is rather uniformed, but there is a quiet dignity that emanates from these stones. This is the area dedicated to the wealthy and the influential, with burial commencing in the late 18th century. One monument in particular is very dear to me, and it belongs to a gentleman I did my dissertation on, or really I should say I did um, my dissertation on his funeral. That monument belongs to Thomas Smith. 
I could happily talk about Thomas, this quietly ambitious and determined man, from humble beginnings as a son of a solicitor to one of Scotland's leading, no, it wasn't a son of a solicitor, it was a son of a soldier, sorry, to one of Scotland's leading solicitors for many an hour. However, for today, I will stick to just his monument. His funeral in 1813 was one of the great walking funerals of the day. The spectacle of the funeral procession with the mutes, battened men, bearers and mourners was a common sight in early 19th century Edinburgh. But this site would fade in just over 20 years time with the opening of the garden cemeteries and the shake up of the values in society regarding the dead. The family of the deceased were often judged on how well a funeral was done and any details missed or financially scrimped over could bring shame crashing down, which the family would probably never recover from. John Smith Cunningham was determined not to let this happen to his family, having recently married Anne Decker Prestonfield, the co-heiress of the Cunningham of Caprington estate and name. Rather than buy a single plot, John bought three. The funeral costs show that no expense was spared, and even after the funeral, two watchmen were employed to watch over the grave to ensure Thomas did not end up on the anatomist table. The funeral cost coming to just over £103 was slightly under the cost of the monument itself. It can be considered quite plain, the monument, as was the fashion of the day. The flamboyance was more for the funeral and not the monument. But the attention to detail is exquisite. It's one of the largest in this area, and unlike a lot of its counterparts, it does not stand against the wall, nor has a navel to its rear to help support it. The very fact it's withstood the test of time is testimony to the skill and expense lavished upon it. It's a fitting tribute to a man who was freestanding in his own world and helped shape a family dynasty. What John Smith Cunningham achieved was beyond what duty called for, and as such, the symbology of this monument is vastly more subtle than its 17th century counterparts, yet it proudly screams out its moral values of its era. That's wonderful. Thank you so much, Charlotte. Um, not least for reminding us that what we can see in Greyfriars today is just one part of a much longer process of burial and commemoration and also for reminding us of the of the value of documentary evidence for letting us understand and document the intangible history associated with Greyfriars like funerals for example. Now I should just mention as well that Charlotte is um, looking with Edinburgh World Heritage to try and um, gather volunteers and supporters to create a new friends of group uh, Graveyards Friends of Group for Greyfriars. So watch out for more information about that event, which is going to take place next week on Thursday um, at the end of this talk. Now, I should just also mention that you are very welcome to start posting questions for uh, myself and the other guest speakers to respond to. So please do, because there should be time today to um, answer your questions at the end. But for um, our next speaker now, I'd really like to introduce Colin Cargill. Now, Colin works on one of the um, Edinburgh tour buses as a tour guide, but he has been a massively um, supportive um, person who has kind of had um, a role in the Graveyards project since its inception, really, at Edinburgh World Heritage, having been a, um, a volunteer in the Friends of New Calton Burial Ground and in Old Calton Burial Ground too. And so I'm really pleased to introduce Colin tonight, and he's going to be talking to us about Edinburgh's Mort safes. Thank you. Just to the south of Greyfriars Kirk are two iron cages known as Mort safes. These reveal how death and burial connect to other darker episodes of our history. The panels on the Mort safes record details of the deceased, but the cages commemorate the steps by friends and family to guard their loved ones from the dreadful crime of body snatching. Disturbing corpses violated not just the law, but cultural and religious customs to care for the dead and ensure their safe passage to the afterlife. But what prompted this gruesome demand for human corpses? The UK's earliest documented case of body snatching took place here in Edinburgh, in fact, in Greyfriars Kirkyard in 1678. 
At this time, by law, medical students and professionals studying anatomy could only dissect the bodies of executed criminals. By the end of the 17th century, Edinburgh surgeons had also obtained the right to dissect the bodies of prisoners who had died in jail and also orphaned babies. But increasing numbers of medical students in the 18th century meant demand far outstripped the supply of legally obtained bodies. Grave robbers met this shortfall. In the dead of night, teams excavated fresh graves with corpses sold to the local anatomists. Grave robbing was highly lucrative. The price paid could equate to one year's wages, although much depended on the freshness of the body concerned. Edinburgh's notorious figures of William Burke and William Hare cannot properly be described as body snatchers, as they murdered their 16 victims before selling their bodies. Bypassing the graveyards, they went straight to source. Robert Louis Stevenson described how on one visit to Gravefriars, he met the local gravedigger who pointed out a house with a window looking onto the graveyard. Here Stevenson wrote, Burke the Resurrection Man, infamous for so many murders at five shillings a head, used to sit there at with pipe and nightcap to watch burials going forward on the green. Lord saves were just one means to foil body snatchers. Others included heavily compacting the soil, placing heavy stone slabs on top of the grave, and building watchtowers where armed patrols might shelter as they protected graveyards after dark. Yet in the end, it was not mort safes or armed guards that stopped body searching, but a change in the law. The 1832 Anatomy Act ended grave ribbon ended grave robbing by finally making it legal for anatomists to source enough bodies for their needs by allowing unclaimed bodies from workhouses to be used instead. Indeed, when Sir Henry Littlejohn, Edinburgh's first medical officer of health, wrote his report on the sanitary conditions of Edinburgh in 1865, he noted with the passing of the Anatomy Act in 1832, graves have remained undisturbed. And I do not know of any case occurring in Edinburgh since that date in which bodies have been removed for the purposes of dissection. The first burial protected by the mort safe on the left in this slide was Elizabeth Jane Lindsay's, who died in June 1832 just one month before the Anatomy Act came into force. Today, when I see these mort safes, they prompt me to pause and reflect upon how the medical knowledge we benefit from today also came at a cost to our forefathers. Thank you so much, Colin. That was tremendous. And thank you so much for reminding us that Gravefriars contains so much more than simply gravestones. And I really appreciated that you could give such a balanced, multifaceted treatment of the dark tourism theme of body snatching. I'd like to move now to introduce some of our other project partners that we're going to be working with, beginning with a film clip from 6VT Youth Group. Now, when I first approached the young people at 6VT about joining our project, I found their response so interesting that I really just couldn't wait to work with them. I needed to build bridges with 6VT to begin with, and this, this isn't mentioned in the film clip, so I just want to kind of tell you about it before we watch and um, find out about their partnership with us in their own words. So, they were um, carrying out a local heritage project, the first local heritage project that they'd been involved with, which was looking at Bessie Watson, who um, grew up, she was born and grew up right next door to the 6VT cafe. And she is known as Scotland's youngest suffragette. 
she was only nine years old when she took part in marches to, um, to, to, to make the case for giving women the vote. Now, I passed on um, details of the family's grave in Merkiston Cemetery um, to the young people. And they were been so impressed by um, Bessie's life that they wanted to go into the graveyard and lay some flowers on her grave as a mark of respect. And I think uh, once you've watched this video clip, you'll understand why that, um, why that outcome just um, pleased me and gave me so much satisfaction. So let's hear from 6VT themselves now. Hi, I'm Fiona Horn. I'm the Operations Manager at 6VT Edinburgh City Youth Cafe. Um, a while back I met with Susan and Mary from Edinburgh World Heritage about the possibility of getting involved with the Graveyards project. Um, they ran through with the, the, some of the, their ideas and their hopes about the Graveyards project. And so a little while later I invited them back to come and speak with our young people and to explain to them you know, their ideas also. It was met with a lot of different reaction, mostly sort of horrified reactions, can I say? They thought that it was a bit disrespectful and a bit rude to be walking on dead people's graves. Um, but there were some people who thought, you know, who quite liked the idea of, of finding out more about the graveyard and about going along to discover some of its stories and things. So last last year, this year actually, in, in February, we took along our one of our holiday clubs on a very rainy day and we introduced them to Greyfriars and they went out with their, their cameras on their phones and they looked around the graveyard and they took pictures of things that they were attracted to or they thought were interesting on the gravestones. And this was to help make up part of the logo for the, for the new project. So when we came back, they all submitted their best photos to me and I sent them off to Susan. He very quickly sent them back with all the meanings that you know the symbols represented. So later on, we printed them out and we took them back out to the young people again and the, the youth cafe as a whole all voted on the ones that they liked best and, you know, and what they meant um, to them. Hi, I'm Kira and I'm a member of 6VT's Youth Board. Last year, Susan and Mary came from the Edinburgh World Heritage to discuss a project about graveyards. This was discussed with the Youth Board and there was many an opinion about it. Not very many people were happy about the fact of going into a graveyard and walking over people's graves as they thought it was very disrespectful. Many people also thought that it would be such a good idea as you can learn background about what people's lives were like before they passed. The young people decided that they would like to be part of the graveyard project as it would be great for 6VT to be involved. On a sad, wet day, a group of young people went to grey fires and took pictures of the gravestones that they found interesting and quite liked the look of. We sent these pictures to Susan, who came back with what they meant. We printed them out and asked the young people to vote on which one they liked best. Everyone thought that the gargoyles would win, but surprisingly, it was the two beautiful palms tied with a ribbon. These symbols stand for victory, triumph, peace and eternal life and during these Covid times we think that it is very relevant. This is the logo and I can agree that it is beautiful. This Friday we are doing our next activity where we are going to a part of grey fires where the public aren't allowed to go. We're going to do some nighttime photography and we're going to listen to stories about people who are buried there. Although many people said that they would never step foot in a graveyard, we do now have a waiting list on people who are really wanting to go. We're delighted that 6VT can be part of this project and we hope that it can make a lasting impression on our young people's lives. We cannot wait to see what lies ahead. So that was really uplifting to um, to hear from the young people about why they selected the um, the image they did for the logo, and it was all about feeling connected to other people, the kind of ties that bound people together, and it just reminded me of 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 how it how 
positive young people are and I'm so delighted that they're participating in the project. So in a moment I'm going to show you a, a new slide that's going to list all of our project partners. So um, I should just say that the project was due to start originally in March of this year but then we all know what happened. So the first thing that I need to do is to thank each of our project partners for their continued support and for finding ways for us to work together despite the difficulties posed by COVID. And I am so truly grateful to everybody because quite simply, without your ongoing support, there wouldn't be a project to launch here tonight. So as you can see from the slide, we will be collaborating with four different groups. First of all, we're going to be collaborating with young people and we'll collaborate with young people through schools, youth groups and through university departments. The Kirkyard is going to be our classroom. We are going to be using its landscape, its monuments, the lives of the people buried there, the history of the graveyard, but also how it is currently being managed to teach a variety of different curriculum subjects. But with the, um, the youth groups and the schools, there will also be opportunities for creative learning too. So where comic books or models and apps can be created to um, convey a inter piece of interpretation um, so that they can share with their classmates, their family and friends, the things that they have found interesting about Greyfriars Kirkyard. Our next three groups are mostly comprised of adults and include people affected by homelessness and Edinburgh's Polish community, but they also we also are working with existing heritage volunteers too particularly with other graveyard friends of groups from across Edinburgh. So I'd like to give a shout out now to Warriston, Morningside, Dalry, Newington and Grange, friends of group volunteers, and suggest that you all go and visit these fantastic cemeteries too. We are also going to be collaborating with Greyfriars Kirk and with their Kirk volunteer guides in this, the Kirk's 400th year centenary having first opened its doors on Christmas Day in 1620. And we are so pleased to be in collaboration at this really important time in, in Greyfriar Kirk's history. And our final group are you, Edinburgh residents, workers and visitors. So we will work with Greyfriar's near neighbours and from those from further afield too following Edinburgh World Heritage's mission for the Edinburgh World Heritage Site to be a dynamic force that benefits everyone. Now, there are three ways in which adults can take part in the project. First of all, through a series of fun training workshops on topics such as graveyard recording, research, interpretation and conservation. Secondly, we're also going to be running hands on projects and carrying out visitor surveys and digital photography. The digital photography project will use techniques such as photogrammetry and reflectance transformation imaging in order to make weathered carves, carvings and inscriptions easier to read and also to create 3D models. Now the photos are really important because they will provide a benchmark by which to measure any changes in future um, levels of preservation and they will also allow us to preserve by record some of our most vulnerable and important monuments. And then the third way that we'll work with the adult volunteers is to create new interpretation. Now this will be co-designed to build on heritage skills and knowledge or to develop life transferable lifelong learning skills. And this, these projects are going to be completely led by our volunteer participants. So I can't really give you a, a kind of firm idea of what the outputs are going to be because it will be up to the imagination and the ideas that our volunteers kind of bring to the project. But it's likely to include things like apps, podcasts, geocaching, filmmaking or game making. So how can you get involved? Well, at the moment, this would be through digital means but we're hopeful that we can have on-site face-to-face activities by summer 2021. The training workshops and the photography and visitor survey projects will be open for everybody to join in and participate with. And there should be a graveyard research workshop scheduled for the new year. So I really do hope you will all come along. And right now you can help us by joining in our mailing list, joining our mailing list so that we can keep you up to date about the events and activities that the project is carrying out. 
and also so that we can find out about your interests and links to the graveyard too. So we'll send you an invitation to join the mailing list after um, tonight's event. Lastly, we need your help in creating a graveyard friends of group. So I really invite you to come along to our online public meeting, which is going to take next, next week, Thursday, the 12th November at 6 p.m. So to conclude, in short, this project is about developing a better understanding of Greyfriars Kirkyard to help protect it for future generations to enjoy. But equally, it is about making sure that the people who take part in the project enjoy themselves because it helps them to feel more closely connected to local community life, as well as to Greyfriars Kirkyard as a place. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you very much, Susan. And I'm not going to bring in our colleague, Barbara, um, because I think there may have been some one or two questions coming in from people who have been joining us this evening. Um, so over to you, Barbara. Any comments, any thoughts, suggestions from audience? Yes, indeed. Yes, quite a lot. Um, there's, a, there's a couple that are linked, really, which um, I don't know that you know the answers to, but it would be quite good if you did. Um, do we know the uh, names of everyone buried in Greyfriars? And where can we get access to burial records? Um, this person, unfortunately, they don't have a, uh, a, a readable name, uh, trying to get uh, details of a relative buried in the Grey Fires um, in the 1790s near the gate to Harriet Hospital, but, but they don't know how to get the um, records. Well, all of the burial records or um, the information that exists is managed by the um, City of Edinburgh Council. So you would need to get in touch with Morton Hall and they would be able to consult the um, burial registers for you. It may well be that if um, your relative was commemorated on a gravestone, then you might find some of the inscription transcripts that have been collected over the years uh, would include information about their gravestone. But obviously not everybody who was buried in Greyfriars had a gravestone. So um, when it comes to knowing everybody's names, I think that the information that's contained in the documentary sources is um, variable depending on when the information was set down and captured. But certainly your best port of call um, for the burial records, the City of Edinburgh Council or the Scottish Genealogy Library for information about the memorial inscription transcripts. And then there's a, a, another one which is um, based on something you said, which is, I guess, is just what is reflectance transference imaging? Oh, well, that is a really um, fantastic um, um, photographic technique, which uses um, a kind of flash gun lighting to take um, to illuminate parts of um, the stone surface. And then you have a kind of, um, well, normally it's a snooker ball, which is a kind of fixed point in, um, in the photographs that allows you to pull all of the photographs together. Um, and then you can manipulate this through a computer program, which is kind of um, freely available, which allows you to literally shine a light in a very detailed way on the surface of a gravestone. It's just, uh, it's, it's quite exciting. It's like, when it works well, it's like magic. Um, well, there's a, there's a question from Atticus. Was there a watchtower in the Kirkyard? Uh, no, there wasn't a watchtower in the Kirkyard, but there was a recorder's office. Um, do you know? Do you know when the recorder's office was built, Charlotte? Um, it was round about the time that the Anatomy Act came in. Um, so, it, I mean, because it's got the windows on every side and the door, so every side you can see from it, it would have been able that you could have seen out, but um, the Anatomy Act had come in by the time it was completed. So I, I'm going to take off the top of my head and say 1836. So I think, I think the kind of the, um, the steps taken to protect people were very much the kind of big tall walled burial enclosures that had kind of big iron gates on and then kind of railings along the top so that people couldn't get in the kind of mort safes and then they'll have been patrolled arms patrols to kind of keep the graveyard safe um one of the uh, other questions is um from lauren um 
she's not resident in Edinburgh. Is there a way that she can get involved remotely? Well, yes, because we're going to do quite a lot digitally to begin with. So there's absolutely a way of getting involved. Um, I think we're really keen to make sure that people um, give us information about what it is they enjoy about the graveyard. But we're also really keen to make sure that people use the new interpretation that we produce. So there will be things like focus groups where you can feed back on, on some of the material that we produce to make sure that, that we are you know, communicating our ideas and information in a, in a kind of an effective way. There's a question which doesn't really apply at the moment, but um, when we do get back to normal, how, how do we best manage visitor numbers to avoid over tourism? Um, would you implement a timed ticket system, for instance, to access the kirkyards? Well, um, that's an issue really, which is being um, considered um, through um, the, the, the council as the graveyards owners. So they're liaising and engaging with stakeholders to come up with a strategy which would um, manage the kind of visitor numbers in a way that doesn't impact on all of the other kind of positive uses that the graveyard can have, but also isn't, isn't going to cause the um, level of um, damage which is currently taking place to the landscape. So that's a kind of work in progress, watch this space, there will be answers to that um, in the very near future, I'm sure. And is there a specialist conservation element to the project? Well, in the sense that we are capturing information about current condition, but I think really to what's of the essence is that any conservation of Greyfriars must start from a place of understanding what's there and then being able to appreciate what the value is of Greyfriars. And that's absolutely at the heart of this project. So it's very much about um, collecting information that will allow an informed decision making about the management of the graveyard going forward but also the friends of group there are many tasks small tasks that volunteers can undertake um, which will improve the um, level of preservation the condition of the graveyard so so yes we will do conservation in some forms and this one i suppose goes to the historians in in the group um, could anyone be buried in Greyfriars or were there conditions? Anyone want to take that one up? Well, it's it's the parish burial ground for um, for Greyfriars Kirk. So, um, so if you were a parishioner in Edinburgh, then you could um, have the right to be buried in that space. But also you could... Um, you could apply to the Kirk session for space to be buried in the Kirkyard. So I think that um, there was um, a mindset amongst the graveyards managers to support um, patronage by high status individuals. Does anybody else want to offer, offer their thoughts about access to the graveyard for burial? Do you have anything to add, Charlotte? I was going to say you've answered that really well. That's more or less what I was going to say. I mean, the West um, Yard was pretty much the who's who of Edinburgh of the day. Um, the main body of the graveyard had been sort of for the parishioners. So you had everybody from paupers right through to Lord Advocates, um, where this newer ground became, you know, for the, the hoi polloi of society as opposed to the paupers. Um, but yeah, you, you answered it well, Susan. I can't really add much more. My understanding is that um, many criminals who were executed on the gallows in Grassmarket were taken to Magdalen Chapel very nearby to the old main entrance, now the bottom entrance to the graveyard. They would be dressed in their grave clothes and then they would be buried in graves that were not of proper purpose. They weren't the full six feet of depth and they would have no markers to where they were laid to rest in the lower section of the graveyard, which I often say to my customers is why in that section, you can see so few headstones relative to the space the area covers. Um, 
there's a there's a couple of um, uh, detailed questions, if you like. Um, was there any record of the remains that were transferred from St Giles Kirkyard? Um, and then another one, which was in 1865, the mass grave of the dead from the Battle of Boromir in 1333 were excavated in Glengyle Terrace, and it's reported the remains were were decently reinterred elsewhere in Edinburgh. Was this in Greyfriars? And if so, where? And is there a record? I don't know if you know the answer to the, either of those. Well, I don't know the answer to um, to either of those <laughs> questions, um, which I think just kind of you know kind of goes to kind of testify how much um, there is still to very to very much to learn about the graveyard. Um, Sounds like we need else? volunteers to help with our research, Susan. Uh, absolutely, yes, definitely. That would be uh, a, a very good outcome from this evening for sure. So I, I guess the final one is is um, going forward what is the uh, method of contact so as you said earlier i think you're sending out an email following on from this to everybody who signed up for today um will there be something else on the website or um, well i think of, of the, the main way we'll get in touch with people is to um is to kind of um invite them to join our newsletter and that way we can communicate with everybody but certainly um, you can get in touch with Edinburgh World Heritage um, through graveyards at ewht.org.uk so that's um, one way of getting in touch with us just give us the email address like once more time at graveyards at edinburghworldheritage.org.uk great Thank you. And everyone who's joined us this evening will be mailing you with further details of the of the kickoff meeting for the friends. Any other questions coming in, Barbara, or are we done? Um, there was one final one, which I don't know whether that means anything to anyone. Does anything remain of the priory? Oh, of the original of the, um, well, I'm sure there'll be some, inf some, some, foundations and other material which um, exists within the archaeological record but I'm not sure whether there's been any um, excavations of the site that's been able to document any of that material. Do you know Charlotte or Fraser if there's been any excavations of, um, of the um, former friary? I don't know of any of the excavations. Um... We do know sort of the site at the bottom end, but it does need more research, which is something that volunteers could take on. Um, again, we're like some of the things we'd like to cover with the friends group. Um, I mean, we don't need people to be from Edinburgh. You could have an interest in Greyfriars. You have so many different skills that people can give. Um, the friends would really just appreciate anybody who's got an interest in Greyfriars to get involved. And I said, that would be a great thing for someone to really look into. Thank you, Charlotte. So thank you very much to Charlotte, to Susan, to Fraser and to Colin for what I thought was a fantastic and enjoyable. Event. It's a very exciting new community project. Greyfriars is a resource for the residents of Edinburgh um, in many, many different ways. So we do hope that everyone will want to get involved and we'll keep you posted on the website and through email as the project progresses. If you've enjoyed this evening, then um, consider, please consider joining us for our next event on Thursday, November the 26th. We have a series of events at the moment looking at Edinburgh as an inspiration, a muse to artists and to writers. So on November the 26th, we are considering the role of public sculpture and monuments. The event is entitled, If You Seek a Monument, Gaze Around, quote from Christopher Wren. And in this live event, our panel will talk about their favorite Edinburgh sculpture and discuss whether the city's monuments present an incomplete and outdated version of the past. Special guests include Alexander Stoddard, the Queen's Sculptor in Ordinary of Scotland, the Director of Edinburgh World, uh, Edinburgh Art Festival, um, Sarah Kerry. Um, and others who will discuss their favorite monuments and sculpture in the city. So looking forward to seeing everyone then. Thank you to everyone for coming this evening and joining us and for the support you all give to Edinburgh World Heritage, to our panelists, and we look forward very much to seeing you all soon. Thank you. Thank you.